you're going to learn a lot about art education. You're going to learn about how school teachers learn. And you're going to learn how to paint what, Mandy? Hi, Eric. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, so today what we're going to do is we are going to work on painting a rose, um, one of these roses set up behind me. And we're going to take it all the way through from the very beginning stages, the first marks on our canvas, all the way through to an olive prima finish today. All right. Well, you're pretty brave to try to get all that done in this short amount of time. Our guest today is Mandy Tice. And Mandy is a superstar. Uh, I got to know her at the FACE conference, the Figurative Art Convention and Expo. And she has developed a national initiative, which is really, really cool. And we're going to talk about that today. But uh, she basically is doing big things to get school teachers interested in uh, elevating the level of art that, that they're doing. And we're going to talk about that. But first, let's get right into the painting, Mandy. And uh, let's see how you do this. Because you're, you're more of an academic painter. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's definitely correct. But as you mentioned, I'm also uh, very much an educator. So the way I approach my drawing is by and my painting is by taking big pieces of information and breaking it into smaller, easy to understand chunks so that um, no matter whether you're an experienced painter or if this is your first time ever watching a painting demo, that you can have an idea of what's going on in the painting and what the thought process is as it's happening. Now, you're also a school teacher. Indeed, I am. So right, and so school. you, you. Uh, by the way, I got to thank you. We had someone else scheduled for today who had a technical problem at the very last minute. So you jumped in. You and I have been talking about some other cool things, and so you jumped in for us at the last minute. Th so thank you for that. And it just happened to be that you didn't have class today, right? <laughs> it's true. Uh, so. Luckily, today was a PD day for teachers, and I can't think of a better way to offer professional development than participating in this demo today with you. So thank you for having me. Okay, and, and to all the school teachers who might be watching, because you know Mandy, uh, thank you for tuning in. My name is Eric Rhodes. I do this every day. This is day number 294. Ooh. We have been at it since coronavirus began, essentially. And wanted to be here for everybody to get them uh, distracted, right, from what's going on in the world, to be upbeat, to, to let you know that everything's going to be okay. And we're doing it with art. So every day we have a different instructor on teaching art. Once in a while I'll talk about art marketing. Once in a while I'll talk about some other things. We've got uh, a mindset expert coming up, for instance. But mostly we're doing art. And we do this every day at 12 noon Eastern. And then every day at 3 p.m. we have a, a, a another video, which is a video of, of the, well, I guess about 600 that we've produced from the top artists in the world, art instruction videos. Mandy, let's get going. Excellent. So I'll go ahead and bring you in here nice and tight. Make sure that All you right. can see um, everything that we have. So because we are limited on time today, I'm really going to focus on this one rose here. And I'm going to take you all the way through my process from the very beginning stages of drawing and go through, um, you know, how I think about this visual information, how I break it down into easier to understand chunks. And then we're going to add the color right in there. So we're going to start with what we call a block in, a line drawing. And then we will start um, blocking in our color and really creating some beautiful forms. And again, focusing on this leftmost rose here. All right. All right. So one of the first things I like to do is I like to um, draw with a little bit of um, thinning my paint with a little bit of Gamasol. Um, and so I'm going to pick a slightly darker color than I would normally use for my own personal work because this is a demonstration and I want to make sure that you at home can really see the line work that I start out with. Now, the biggest idea that you're always thinking about is what is the height versus the width of your subject? So if I'm working on this one rose, I'm going to include these three leaves behind here and I'm going to think how high is it from this point, which is my highest point, to my lowest point here and also my width. But the leftmost side is easy to figure out. It's over here. But the rightmost side, I have to be decisive because I'm only doing the one rose. So I'm going to say my rightmost point is the edge of this petal here. So if I compare what the width looks like compared to the height, I can see if I measure with my paintbrush here, here's the height. And if I turn it sideways, I can see that the width of what I'm trying to draw and paint today is about 60% of my height. So the first thing I'm gonna do on my canvas is create some marks 
so that the height is about um, a little bit taller than my width, so that my width is about 60% of my height. So I made my guesses, and now I'm going to take my highest measurement, the height, and I'm going to compare it to my width. And I can see that that's a little bit wider than 60%. So I'm going to bring it in just a touch. Once I feel confident about those little marks, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw a box using those marks. And the reason I draw this box is because it really helps you set the proportion for your whole painting, for your whole drawing. So I'm going to go ahead and make this box because when I teach painting, I reference this box a lot. And we'll, we'll talk about that throughout this demo today. All right, now your lines don't have to be absolutely perfect. Um, you know, these lines aren't even gonna be in our final um, piece. They're just there to give us some reference points. So um, a lot of times when I'm working with people who are new to oil painting, they're like, why would I put lines down that I have to erase back? But it's really helpful for organizing visual information. We now know that everything we're gonna draw and paint is gonna fit inside this box. And that also helps us figure out our composition. This rose and these leaves kind of have a thrusting gesture um, upwards and to the left. So I'm thinking about what would that look like once I have it on my canvas here. And I want to make sure that the placement of where this box is, we know that the right edge is this rose. So it's a great opportunity to think about what my final composition will look like with the final leaves. So this means that that big rose, the focus will be just slightly off center and have a thrust in the left direction. And I think that'll make a pretty interesting composition. So just with this one box, I've now done two things. I found the height versus the width, and I've also figured out what my overall composition is gonna be. I've created the placement on my canvas. Now, the next thing I really wanna do is figure out what the biggest shape is. So if you are looking at this rose over here, you can be like, oh my gosh, there's a leaf and a leaf and a leaf and a petal and a petal and this like other kind of petal leaf thing. Um, that's all a lot of information to think about at one time. So one way to start simplifying information in order to accurately get it from what you're observing onto your canvas is to think about the biggest shape. So instead of thinking about this leaf as going, oh, it goes in and then up and then down, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna think about a line connecting those two leaves. And I'm gonna think about a line connecting these two leaves. And then I'm gonna think about this bottom of the leaf connecting to my rose and the edge of my rose petal connecting to that top leaf. And so that's just a small number of straight lines that will kind of describe my biggest shape. That is very helpful. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times what happens is we can get overwhelmed by visual information, right? Um, and so any tool we have for simplifying visual information is going to help us be better artists. So when I'm looking at trying to make this line on my page, I'm asking myself a few things. I'm asking myself, what is the angle of that line? Um, and so I'm holding up my paintbrush and I'm citing that angle over here. So I'm going to translate that line by citing the angle. And that, that's actually pretty good. I'm happy with that. Okay, now another way we can do this, I call this the zero to 100 method. So if I put zero here and 100 on this corner, and I'm trying to figure out where does this top leaf point go, I know that my box is, you know, if I had my vertical line here, this would be my zero, and the edge of my rose is 100. So I can see from my point of view that the tip of that leaf is really far over. It's like at 90 maybe. All right, so that's another way that you can think about visual information and help translate that big shape that you're seeing over to your canvas. So by combining these methods, um, I'm gonna go ahead and take this leaf. I'm just gonna follow the angle of the bottom leaf. And then of course this edge represents the very edge of my biggest rose here. Now, Mandy, now, for the people who tuned in late, uh, will you just go ahead and, and restate uh, where you're cutting off the composition so they understand oh, that? Oh, absolutely. So we are working on just this one rose here. So I am working this one rose and these three leaves. So for those right. of you just joining us, the shape on the canvas is representing, um, so this line is representing the top of our leaves here. This angle is representing our connection between these two leaves. And then this upward angle here is the angle of the bottom leaf. 
All right. Now, the great thing about having a method is you can go from your biggest ideas to your smallest ideas and use the same method again and again. So now if I want to know what shape is the biggest shape of my rose, I now have a general idea of where that rose is going to go here. And again, there's like a petal and a petal and a petal, but I don't have to think about all that information at one time. If I just thought about there being a line across the top of the petal, I can ask myself, where would that line be over here? And so I can see that that top of my rose is below the two points of the leaves. And I know that this line represents the top two points of the leaves. So I know it's gonna be a little bit below there. But I can also see that it takes quite a bit of distance to get from the top of the rose to my bottom most point down here. So I know that my rose, the top of my rose is gonna be closer to the top of my composition than to the bottom. So um, by making choices and making decisions like that, that helps us get things in the right place. So I call this a follow through line when I'm citing a line and I'm just making it go all the way through my composition here. Now, it's always helpful to put a line down and then ask yourself, is this actually in the right place? So if this is the bottom of my composition and this is the top, here's my bottom, here's my top. Um, it's above halfway when I'm observing it. Aha, it's above halfway over here. It's a good way to check your work. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to continue making the biggest shape. It's kind of like a square shape. If I were to put a few straight lines to describe the biggest shape of this rose, I could use just a small number of straight lines to determine the overall shape of my rose. Um, and I'm also thinking about if I were to extend that line all the way through, where would it hit? Now, I could see that I made that line too low because my rose is actually a little bit higher than that in relation to the bottom of my leaf here. So I'm just finding my biggest shape here. You take a complex subject and make it so easy. <laughs> well, you know, that's the beauty of really painting. Like, I really believe that um, beautiful, realistic academic painting at its absolute best is saying the most beautiful thing with the least amount that you can, right? So we're trying really hard to make sure that we're including things that enhance the viewer's feeling of the final painting and eliminating any of the noise that isn't necessary. Okay, so this kind of looks like a mess. Oops, sorry. If I told you, haha, this is a realistic painting of a rose, you might tell me to go get lost, right? I might. It does not <laughs> look like this yet. And again, for those of you just joining us, we are working on just this section here. So just the leftmost rose, the upper leaves, and the bottom here. But, um, you know, we have to think really abstractly and really big to make sure that we get things in the right place. And once we've done that, we can start breaking down that information into smaller pieces. So if I wanna just focus on this leaf for a second, you know, I can start using just a few simple lines. Now that I know where that leaf goes, where it belongs, where it cuts through my big rows, to start making some judgments about its shape. Right, and then we have this tall, really high looking one over here. And I want to make sure that, you know, as you draw, you want to make sure that everything's still in the right relationship to everything else in your drawing. So I can see that maybe this point needed to be a little bit lower because the relationship between the right leaf and the bottom leaf has a steeper angle than I originally guessed. And that's okay. So if you need to change things, that's fine, but always go back and relate it to the whole. Can you move your camera a little bit to the left because we're cutting off that top leaf? There we go. Good. All right, thank you. And of course, always with these live demos. Um, so I give demos every first Thursday um, through School of Atelier Arts, which is the atelier that I run. And so of course, with these live demos, we try as much as possible to make sure that your view is as close to my view as we can get it but there will be just a little bit of a difference um, because the camera cannot exactly be where my eyes are or you wouldn't be able, uh, I wouldn't be able to see the work. 
We're going to have to get you glasses that have a camera in them. <laughs> Is that a real thing? Does that exist? Yeah, it does. I had no idea that that was a thing. You know, I, you know, as an oil painter, I mix dirt with oil and spread it on woven linen for a living. So technology is always an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you do a, you do, you said you do a, a demo on the first Thursday of every month. Yep. Absolutely. And you can find it at schoolofatelierarts.com. Mm -hmm. And I try to make it by, so all of our demos are by donation because we work with a lot of um, school teachers and students, um, you know, from all over the world. And so we do it by donation to, you know, provide the greatest access we can to the most people to this type of drawing and painting information. Maybe I should draw with the brush part. <laughs> I was drawing with the bottom of that as well. Okay, and you know, this leaf kind of sweeps up off of our composition here, so I'm just going to let it go. Um, and then I'm really going to focus now on the rose because the leaves, although they have some change in color, they're pretty flat overall, whereas all the form, all the interesting lights and darks are actually on our rose proper. And because we are very limited uh, on the amount of time we can spend today, I really want to make sure that I get into um, the biggest and most interesting part of our composition here. So now I'm doing the same thing again. So now I'm just finding the biggest shape around the biggest chunk of the rose. And then I'm gonna start literally peeling off one petal at a time using um, you know, this idea of working from the biggest ideas to the smallest ideas. And you know, as you refine, you can start erasing the bits that you no longer need. Um, and you know, it, you'll be amazed at how just kind of carving away at these bigger shapes you'll suddenly start seeing um, your, you know, some of the realistic feeling of the rose um, in particular emerge. Do you ever get confused with all your lines? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, you know, so a lot of times what I don't think people understand is that uh, realistic drawing and painting training has a lot to do with visual memory. I remember when I first started my atelier training, I would be looking at my subject, sorry, I'd be looking at my subject over here and like sight to line just perfectly. And I get over here and I'd be like, what does that represent again? <laughs> like I forget, right? And as you practice, as you learn, you develop a better visual memory that makes that part of the drawing process less frustrating. I wanna tell you guys, by the way, that um, uh, we got people watching from all over the world. Hello, Netherlands. Hello, United Kingdom. Hello. Wow. Uh, welcome. Let's see, I'm scrolling through. But I, I wanna mention that we, Ireland, welcome. Uh, put where you're from in the comments. That way we uh, know who's watching, but also we have prizes. Uh, today's prize, uh, we, uh, the winner of yesterday's digital subscription to Plein Air Magazine is Weeby Collar from Norway. Weeby, congratulations. Uh, we'll be getting that to you. The digital subscription to Plein Air Magazine has 20% more content than the, the print. Also, the Easel Brush Clip is the prize today from easelbrushclip.com you have a chance to win that uh, and uh, we'll send it to you wherever you are in the world. It's from easelbrushclip.com. And just by making comments, we will pick somebody randomly from the comments and you'll have a chance to win. And we'll, it doesn't have to be on the live. We're going to do it from the replays too. All right, Mandy, sorry to interrupt. Oh, uh, no, that's very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to see such a broad array of interest uh, in our painting demonstration today. It's always lovely, um, especially because, you know, this, where ateliers are located, where you can find this knowledge, it, it's really hit or miss depending on where you are in the world. Um, so I actually get uh, a lot of requests from art teachers in Australia, actually, um, for information and resources on how to teach realistic drawing and painting in their classrooms as well. So it's really wonderful to see such a diverse group here um, from all over the world who share the love of painting. Like what a glorious way to spend a noon hour here. Well, and you have a program, don't you, where you you have a, a degree program for, uh, for art teachers? Absolutely. So I'm so proud and happy to announce that we actually have a master's of art degree um, in studio art and it's designed specifically for art teachers, although you don't have to be an art teacher to come, as long as you understand that we'll be spending a lot of time talking about how to teach art in the program. And what's really exciting is that it's only in the summer. So teachers, you know, they teach during the school year, they get the summers off. And well, in theory, they get the summers off. They're always really busy working on lesson plans and whatnot. 
Um, but it's just six weeks every summer, three summers, you get your degree um, and that sweet pay bump. If you're in the United States and you get that pay bump for your master's uh, degree. So um, it's really exciting. It's through a partnership with the Florence Academy of Arts. And also, I'd like to throw a thank you to Gamblin Paints as well, because they have very generously donated oil paint to that program so that we can provide quality oil painting experiences uh, for our teachers and show them how to teach that in their classroom. How many people do you have in the program at any given time? Um, so we're only accepting 30 people each year, 10 in person and 20 in our remote option. So for those of you who are international, we do have a remote option that may be a good choice for you. Um, and the in-person option right now is already half full. Uh, we just launched it a couple weeks ago. Um, I have to check my records to see how many spaces we currently have in the online section, but it's really exciting to see how it really struck a chord of interest and, and demand within um, the community and, and people searching for you know, the degree to go with the skills. Because as Andy, you know, I, I will give you a uh, subscription to Fine Art Connoisseur magazine for each of your students. Oh, thank you so much, Eric. That's absolutely fabulous. And what a wonderful uh, way to add to our curriculum there. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. okay. Tell us what you're doing now. All right. So, you know, we're just kind of breaking down our big shape of the rose here. Um, so you can see that we started with the big shape and now we're just kind of cutting into it a little bit here, cutting into it a little bit there, um, you know, just really trying to identify the exact shapes of some of the petals here. Um, and what we're gonna do now uh, is because we are very short on time, I wanna make sure to at least get to the color part of the rose. Now, a lot of people would go right for the rose, but the most important thing about a painting is having an idea of where your lights and your darks are. And if I don't deal with the surrounding area of the rose at all, it's going to not look very bright. It's going to feel super dull, um, especially because these green leaves overall are fairly dark in value. So I'm just going to put a little bit of value in the leaves around the rose, and then I'm going to spend the rest of our time actually painting the rose. All right. So, so the, the school is in New Jersey. Is that correct? I'm getting asked questions. Yes. Yeah, so the school, um, the in-person program is actually in New Jersey. It is at St. Peter's University in Jersey City, New Jersey. It's just outside of New York City. So for those of you who have spending a summer learning art in New York City on your bucket list, it's, uh, it, this is your time, all right? Um, and so we have space there. We have a full easel set up. Um, and here's a secret that has not been officially released yet. Julia Aristides will be a teaching fellow for this program. The Julia Aristides, the famous international author and um, painter extraordinaire. So We did her video, by the way. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And I, I strongly recommend um, all of her teaching materials. She's, she's a wonderful instructor. Um, so, uh, yeah, it would be wonderful to have you here. And the program is actually two years in Jersey City. And then if you're doing the in-person option, uh, I'm sorry, you have to go to Florence for one of your summers <laughs> and oh, study at the Florence tough. Academy of Art. It's terrible. It's I know. It's it's a real hardship, I realize, but you're just going to have to go. You're, you're kind of blocking the camera. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Make sure you guys tell us where you're watching from. And if you guys are enjoying Mandy's teaching style, I think she's such a great teacher. Give her a, a like or a thumbs up or a heart or something. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and and go ahead and share this. You know, tell your friends about it. We would love that. Definitely. And for any of the art teachers that are here, I encourage you to um, be part of the very active art teacher group Facebook community. I. Um, uh, I'm part of one community that I started called Atelier Art Teachers, where we really focus on teaching um, realistic drawing and painting skills uh, to art teachers. So um, if you teach art, whether you are a licensed teacher or you teach in your studio or other things, and you'd like to learn more about how to teach these techniques to students, I hope you'll join us. Would you uh, explain to people what an atelier is? A lot of people don't know that term. Oh, absolutely. So an atelier is basically, a, a, it's a French word. It means studio. But um, today it's commonly used to discuss and describe um, a type of realistic drawing and painting training that um, creates realistic results. So it used to be the way that most artists in the West were trained. And then it fell out of favor about 100 years ago when this idea that somehow training would ruin your inherent creativity. 
And when it fell out of favor, a lot of the knowledge that had been painstakingly passed from generation to generation of artists was actually almost lost. It, it was a really tragic time as far as technical knowledge went in art. Um, a lot of people don't realize that just like in math, right, there are scientific discoveries um, that combine, like we have the Pythagorean theorem, we also have Arabic numerals, you know, this is collected knowledge that wasn't created just at one time, it was collected over a long period of time. And that's essentially what atelier training is, it's the collected knowledge, collected knowledge about how to draw and paint realistically, um, that's really centuries worth of an inheritance. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time fussing with the leaves because the fun part, of course, is the rose proper here. I'm just trying to get some of these dark values in so that they don't distract um, and that they really help enhance the brightness of the rose. I'm going to throw a little bit of this background value in just so that the whole rose is surrounded. Now, if you were doing this where, where you were doing a layered painting, you would probably do do this. You, know, you probably wouldn't start out with green color. You'd start out with a, a tone of some kind. Oh, absolutely. So if I were doing a formal, um, full-on atelier painting that I was going to take to a high finish, um, I would do an underpainting um, in grisaille. Um, painting in grisaille just means painting in black and white. Um, and then that kind of sets all your values. So it helps you figure out where are the light parts, where are the dark parts. So again, it's about organizing that visual information in an easy to understand way. If you guys have any questions, just go ahead and put them in the comments. I'm reading comments. Hello, Nova Scotia. Woohoo. Hello, Quebec. Hello, France. Bienvenue. Excellent. So happy to have you here. Thank you for being here and sharing your... Um, I don't know what time it is in some of those countries, but thank you for yep. joining us today. Somebody said giving you a virtual hug. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Cambru, United Kingdom. Excellent. South Africa. Wow. Another uh, Sulfic United Kingdom. Now, I have a special hey, when, place. When you, guys, when you guys share this, all your other artist friends over there, wherever you are, will see it. British Columbia, thank you. So what are you doing now? All right, so I'm just throwing a few color notes in and just trying to do what I call keying the painting. So I'm putting a couple notes here. I'll put a couple notes um, over here. And you know, just because my canvas is white, I painted on a white canvas, I wanna make sure to get some of those really darkest areas in first, um, you know, because that'll help determine the direction of the painting. Um, now, uh, when you're painting roses in particular, the petals of flowers are transparent. And so it creates what's what I like to call chromatic darks. All right. So they're not the same as other darks. They're, they're not these dark, inky, um, you know, colors that you'll see in, in other objects that you paint, because there's actually a lot of vibrancy and color um, in these areas of your painting. So you can see that I'm going for pure cad and a little bit of my hot pink here and you know to build up these dark values so that they're not just dark in value but they also have a little bit of chroma to them. What kind of paint and brushes are you using? Oh, excellent question. Um, so full disclosure, Gamblin uh, very generously donates paint to the art teachers I work with all over the country. Um, and I have found that I've really enjoyed using their paint. So the majority of my paint is Gamblin. Um, the exception being Gamblin does not currently make a lead white. And lead white, I'm particularly fond of. Um, I, you have to decide for yourself if it's something that you want to mess around with. Uh, but I love the way color sings in lead white. Um, as far as my brushes go, I'm a huge fan of the brush maker out of England, uh, Rosemary and Company. And um, she's a lovely woman. It's a small um, company that hand makes every brush. And every time I pick up a rosemary brush, I just feel like, um, you know, like you're stepping into the old way of things. Uh, and it, it's a really joyful feeling for me. Um, and Rosemary does not yet sponsor me. So I'm saying this completely free will <laughs> that I love the brushes. <laughs> and do you always keep your palette vertically like that? Oh, I rarely ever keep my palette vertically like this, but when I do the painting demos, um, you know, I try to give as many opportunities for as much knowledge as I can. So, um, you know, when 
people are able to see at least a little bit of, of the brush um, and how the paint's being mixed. I, I try to provide that opportunity. Um, right. It is a love hate though, because I definitely prefer holding my palette. So if right. you come to my first Thursday painting demonstrations, the ones that I do every first Thursday of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, you will find a mixed bag of whether I'm holding the palette or, or have it pinned up for you, uh, depending on uh, you know how I'm feeling that day. What kind of lead white do you use? Um, so I'm currently using Williamsburg lead white, but, um, Great paint. yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I try a lot of different lead whites. I'm trying to find one, you know, sometimes I want a more thick consistency in my lead and other times I want, you know, a harder consistency in my lead. So I'm always kind of dabbling, uh, back and forth between different variations of lead white. I want to remind you guys that her website is a uh, school of atelier arts, A T E L I. E R arts. And that's where you can find out about the Thursday uh, demo uh, first Thursday demo and all the other teaching tools that Mandy has. Yes. And I also strongly encourage you to sign up for the school of Atelier arts newsletter. We send out free lesson plans, free how to tutorials, um, anything to help people learn how to draw and paint realistically. We send out through our newsletters. So it would be lovely to have you as part of our wildly, uh, wildly enthusiastic newsletter community. It's a very popular newsletter. All right, so I'm still kind of working on the darks um, because I want the lightest areas to start popping and I have to bring down the darks in order to make that happen. I think what people will start to see here is that these big shapes will really start to form uh, the whole once you start seeing them filled in. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, even though this is a rose, it's easy to think about, oh, it's a big rose that has all this complicated information. But sometimes it's helpful to think of the rose as a sphere. Like if it were a sphere, where's the light coming from? Where might the light catch? Where's the darkest bit going to be? Where are your core shadows to be found? And it's kind of an orienting way to figure out um, you know, where lights and shadows go because there's a lot of little pieces in there that can get you off track. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I think is interesting is that I hear from a lot of art teachers and a lot of them say, where do I learn to paint? And, the, and, and I'm like, well, why would you need to learn to paint? You're an art teacher. But there are a lot of people who have degrees in teaching art, but were never taught to paint or draw. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Um, so that's absolutely true. If you think about it, um, the profession overall, you need a college degree and colleges is not th this training is found in ateliers, which with the exception of our Masters of Art program, it's one of the first accredited atelier programs in the world. Right. So it wasn't an option. Uh, if you wanted the license to teach, at least in the United States, you had to get the college degree. Um, and, you know, the university is really uh, followed that mantra that um, training would somehow ruin your creativity. And so um, you'll find a lot of theory-based um, art education at universities. Um, and I'm not anti-theory, uh, but I believe in the balance between skills and theory. And I feel like right now, for the most part, we're way out of whack. Like we're teaching all theory and not as many skills as I would like to see. So, Well, if you go back through history at the beginning of modern art, all the modern artists were academically trained. But the second generation of art, modern artists was not. Oh, absolutely. Like Picasso had classical training, but did he train anybody? No, he did not. So how could we expect educators today to have training when their teachers didn't have training and their teachers' teachers didn't have training? So um, that's why, you know, this idea of this master's program is so important to me um, because we're able to bring to teachers um, this knowledge in a way that has not been accessible to art teachers in almost 100 years. Hello, Dublin. Hello. Cochrane, Canada, Alberta. Welcome, welcome. I used to live uh, in Montana, which, um, you know, made me really appreciate our Canadian neighbors and, and how kind I always found our Canadian friends when they would visit. I'm getting some questions about your palette. Okay. Your colors. Oh, okay. So um, when I'm painting flowers, I have a few colors on my palette that 
aren't on my standard palette because you need special colors to paint chromatic objects. So these pink roses are actually quite chromatic. So you need um, some paint that's a little bit more chromatic than maybe you would otherwise um, have on your palette. So some of these extra colors I have here um, are a quinacridone rose. We can't really see it. Oh, um, let me pull it down here for a second. All right, so I have a quinacridone rose. I have a brilliant pink. Um, I have a quinacridone you red. You lower it a little bit. Oh, thank there you, you sorry. Uh, so quinacridone rose, quinacridone red, um, brilliant pink. Um, I love lead tin yellow. I always have it on my palette, no matter what. I just love painting with lead, I guess. I can't help it. Um, and then this is my lead white, and this is uh, my titanium white. Um, I have both because sometimes the lead white just isn't powerful enough to get your lights bright enough. Um, and then I have a viridian green, a cad green light, a black, um, an ultramarine blue, and I think I think that's the whole palette. And I used to have some burnt sienna up here that um, got mixed in somewhere. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here because I really want to make sure that we get to that magic place here uh, where things really start popping for us. I like magic. <laughs> I like magic too. And like, that's half the pump fun. Can you explain, yeah. uh, Mandy, what, chromatic means yes absolutely so chroma means the intensity of a color so for example um the red of my shirt here is very very intense it's a super intense red relatively speaking but if you look at this vase you could also say that it has a lot of red in it but it's not very intense it's like a brownie red all right so we would say that that was neutralized red so my shirt would be chromatic and the vase would be less chromatic. We would call that neutral. So chroma is the opposite of neutral. Um, I actually, um, on the School of Atelier Arts web um, YouTube channel, uh, there's a whole video where I explain chroma. So that could be a good resource for you. All right. Well, Meline says, this is magical. <laughs> Thank you, Meline. Thank you, uh, you know, uh, for, for being here today and getting to, to share with us and, and paint with us. It's always a pleasure to kind of spend time with people who love and appreciate art. So thank you for sharing some of your time with me. Your hair's getting in the way. Uh, talk about, uh, Charlotte says, what do you think about zinc white as a transparent white? Is lead white much better? Um, I've tried zinc white exactly one time and I didn't like it as much as lead. Um, so I didn't give it a fair shot, but um, the one time I did try it, I just didn't like it as much. Um, we should I'm also just, mention for everybody that uh, there's a lot of danger in using lead. And so you have to be very careful about your protocol, things like uh, not sanding it so you're not breathing the particles, you know, not getting it in your, uh, don't eat it. Yes. <laughs> Definitely don't eat it. Um, and that's very true. You know, um, a lot of artists choose just not to mess around with it. Um, you know, I know some artists that have been tested and had pretty high lead counts and stopped using it. Um, but I just, I really like it. Yeah, I get, I use lead and I get every time I have uh, a blood test, which is three or four times a year, I uh, always have them check for lead. Yeah, that's smart. That's very smart. Um, I should start doing that. Next time I negotiate for health benefits, I'll make sure to include that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'm getting a little distracted with this one petal over here, and I want to make sure to really finish out this top. Have you tried the lead white replacement that Gamblin makes? You know, actually, I haven't, and I definitely should. I didn't know that they had one, actually. Um, so... Because I don't ask for lead white, you know, when I'm working with students, <laughs> naturally. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Our guest today is Mandy Tice, and she's with the School of Atelier Arts, and her goal is to teach art teachers around the world how to teach art to get kids more interested in training. Uh, she also has a, a lot of kids that end up taking some of her courses, and uh, she offers, what is it, a um, an MA? Um, yes, an MA, a Master's of Art. 
um, in studio art. It's a completely studio based program and you can learn more about it at school of atelier arts.com. Yep. We've got that on the screen. Great. Well, I hope you guys are enjoying this. Make sure to leave comments. Tell us where you're from. We're giving away uh, an easel brush clip today, which is a tool that you can hold your, your uh, brushes in. We'll have to, Mandy, you probably don't have one. We'll have to get you one. Oh, I would love to have one. I could definitely use a tool like that. Um, that would be so helpful to me. What I like about it is it I keeps my, the brushes that I commonly use right at my eye level. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah, and something else I'd love to hear from you in the chat about is do you, you use lead white and why or why not? I'd love to get a more global perspective on who's using lead and who's like, no, I'm not touching that. Yeah, okay, that's a good idea. Put it in the comments. Outstanding. Mandy, uh, you were at the FACE conference. Uh, what was your what, what your thoughts on the FACE conference? Oh my gosh, the FACE conference was so phenomenal. It's such a wonderful feeling being with so many different types of artists all in different places in their painting journey. Um, and, you know, seeing some of your heroes, you know, that you've been following for many years, you know, getting to see them paint live and, and teach workshops. Um, I, I cannot recommend it enough. In fact, um, you know, I, I regularly... Uh, advertise it to my art teachers being like, you gotta go to this. It's really your cool. Your hair is blocking again. Sorry. I'm going to go ahead and throw my hair up so that that stops being a problem. Yeah. Okay. Sorry I thought you that. started to say, I'm going to go ahead and throw up. I was going, what? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and finish that phrase. I'm going to throw it up with my hair being. Somebody uh, said it's hard to clean off your hands. I, I, uh, I paint with gloves always because some materials, including cadmiums, can be toxic, and I just don't want to take any chance. Uh, so, uh, and I like to paint with my fingers to smooth edges and stuff, and I don't want that going into my liver. <laughs> that that's a fair fair thought there. Um, Although some people say gloves are a bad idea, so I don't know. Uh, why do people say gloves are a bad idea? What's the argument there? Uh, because it makes your hands sweat and more absorbent. Oh, I hadn't heard that argument. All Anchorage, right. Alaska says I don't use lead white. My studio is next to my kitchen as a shared area. You know, you have to be careful about materials if you've got kids or pets around too. I, I use some uh, powdered pigment sometimes. And um, we, Lori and I went on vacation. We had a babysitter and uh, I came home and there was yellow powder spread <gasps> all throughout my studio. And, and it was a, like a lead tin yellow. Oh, and no. so, I, you know, I'm just mortified because I thought my son probably is breathing in all this dust. Right. Yeah, that's that's definitely no good. That's not what you I want. I should get him tested. <laughs> all right. So sometimes when you're painting flowers, it's scary to go as dark as you really need to. But it's these little dark areas that really start defining some of the upper petals that you need to define. Somebody says they're playing hooky from their school PD to watch this. <laughs> um, I love that. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, I actually got permission from my school district to offer this as a PD for, oh, you're not really getting away with anything. You got tricked into attending a PD. <laughs> what is a PD? A PD is a professional development event. So teachers ah. have to complete a certain amount of, um, you know, professional development to maintain their licenses and whatnot. So. So you're super welcome here. I'm glad you made it. If you are happen to be a New York teacher, the School of Atelier Arts can issue PD certificates. So I can send you one for being a part of this workshop today if you're in the state of New York. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, we ought to, you know, we ought to talk. Maybe we can make this daily program since it's on every day for an hour. Maybe we can figure out how to get PD credits for teachers. Uh, although, you know, they, they might have to watch it after hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, we could definitely figure that out. I, I'm sure that this would qualify, um, and, you know, quality art instruction every day. Uh, Valerie says, or somebody, let's see. Uh, Valerie said she stopped using lead white when she was expecting after reading the warning label. Um, somebody said they noticed you use your pinky finger to stabilize. Uh, yes, indeed, I, I do. Um, 
So uh, yeah, I just, I like having the control and I think it actually stems from, I, when I was growing up, like any normal 13 year old girl, I loved um, needlepoint. <laughs> so, you know, when I was doing my needlepoint, my sewing projects, I always went there. And so when I translated, you know, to working with a brush, it's just uh, something from that phase of my life that stuck. Now we've got about, oh, about 10 minutes left. No. No. No, it's that time. It can't be. No. We better giddy up here. Do you ever use a mall stick? Um, you know, I rarely paint big enough to justify a mall stick because as long as I'm painting small, I can, you know, go off my pinky here. But yeah. um, you use a pinky stick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, something that I'm always telling my students uh, is, you know, use the tool that's proportionate to the job, whether that's the right brush size or, um, you know, the right mole stick size. You know, uh, when I first got into atelier training, actually, I made this giant mole stick, right? It was huge. And it's like really only useful if I want to make a six foot painting. Uh, but I was really, really proud of it at the time. <laughs> James Andrews says, Eric and Mandy, maybe we can talk about offering clock hours through our state association. Wouldn't that be great, James? Definitely um, contact me. Yes. You um, know, uh, we, we, have, we have had, um, I, I, I can't even come up with numbers, but we've had huge numbers of people who have been watching this broadcast every day or when they can, some people who have never picked up a paintbrush in their life got the courage to do it from watching some of our instructors. Some of them had not picked up a paintbrush in 20 or 30 or 40 years. And they, you know, they painted when they were younger and now they're older, they have time. And, and so uh, it's pretty cool to see this. What Rosemary brush series and number are you using presently? Um, so this is the ivory series. Um, and this size brush is there too in the ivory. Um, yeah. I'm very lazy about washing brushes. Um, you'll find that I'll wipe my brush and I have kind of this system where if I'm going from a dark to a light that I will just wipe it on my um, paper towel, run it into some light color and then go into my light because I hate washing brushes. If I can do a painting with the smallest number of brushes, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's me too. Yeah. I, I hope to someday be very rich so I can use them and throw them away and then <laughs> <laughs> and then support the brush companies. Yeah, well, I, I keep hoping that like uh, I'll, I'll get to that place where I can just hand my brushes off to the students in my studio and be like, this is your only job. <laughs> you have to wash my brushes. I'll teach you anything you want. Just it's really brushes. taking shape. The form is really, really beautiful. So you're now blending form. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really, now that I have a general idea, I'm cleaning up some edges. I'm reshaping some things. I'm blending some of my notes together now that I feel more certain about them. Um, and, you know, I still have a few color and value issues. So for example, this is the right value on this petal here, but it needs to be a little bit more pink. So I'm just kind of working on making small adjustments like that. All right. I want to say congratulations to Debbie Baller, Baylor, who just retired as an art teacher because of COVID-19 is now focusing on her heart. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. A whole new career is happening. Debbie, uh, uh, I'm going to send you my book, How to Make More Money Selling Your Art. Now that you're going to get into it full time, uh, you're going to have to send me your contact information, Debbie, but I'm going to send you my book. Congratulations. Oh, that's just wonderful. I know, I know that a lot of teachers uh, are really uh, trying to figure out, you know, especially if they're on the verge of retirement, you know, whether they want to, um, you know, keep teaching the COVID situation. It's, for all the art teachers here, I applaud each and every one of you. I know that I've been teaching remote um, this whole year and uh, what a challenge it's been. And, you know, even to have the gumption right now and the effort and the life still in you and the love for art to be here today, uh, kudos to all of you. I uh, uh, I don't think I told you. Oh, maybe I told you this when we talked the other day. But um, we we've been working on a secret project. I think it's going to be announced today. But uh, we have been studying uh, how people learn, and we've discovered that because so many people are learning learning on Zoom now, that um, a lot of them are getting frustrated, and of course need need to be more successful. So we're developing a, a concept that we're going to announce and a new way of learning art uh, and some things that we're going to do with it that are going to be announced uh, this week. So 
Um, if you're not on my email list, you probably should be. That's really looking beautiful, by the way. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, so um, no pressure painting in front of uh, <laughs> lots of people. You know, I do it every first Thursday, you know, for the painting demos. But, you know, every time you go to paint something, it's its own visual problem. It's its own challenge. You need different techniques, different skills, different applications of what you know. So it, it's always a challenge painting in front of people and, you know, keeping your nerves in line, but it's always so rewarding to be able to share with people who really care about learning. Um, it's such a joy. Well, I encourage everybody to go to her school of atelier uh, when we're done, uh, we're going to also show them your shirt. I think it's so cool. And, and I, <laughs> and I see that you sell that shirt on your website. Oh, absolutely. You're quite the entrepreneur. I mean, you're doing <laughs> a lot to really help people, which is very cool. Thank you. I've learned a lot from you through the years, Eric. So, you know, I've been following Eric for many years. And as someone that has been making my living from my art um, in various capacities, you know, it's been hugely wonderful to have access to the wonderful resource and all the great ideas that Eric has, you know, in his communications and his books um, at the conferences that, that he helps run. I mean, you you've done more for education than I think you realize, Eric. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. We're all in this together. We're trying to make it better for everybody. So you're gonna, you've got about two minutes left. Okay, um, but, two minutes left. I'm gonna just kind of um, take away some of the white distraction and just throw in a little bit of color here for the stem, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Now, and what you can do is uh, when you post, uh, the, you take the image and post it in here um, in the comments later, you're going to go in later and answer questions anyway. And then, Absolutely. Um, and then you can post the finished painting. When it's got the background in, that, that rose is going to pop out because oh, that yeah. white won't be distracting the eye. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys think you can do this now? <laughs> uh, after watching this, press the heart button if you think you can do it. Be real curious. I hope that everybody feels empowered to, to at least apply some of those beginning concepts we talked about. Like, even if all you do the next time you sit down in a painting is find the height versus the width, I think you'll really impress yourself with um, how you can get a proportionate final result. If you didn't see that at the beginning, you want to make sure you watch the replay because the height versus width, really, really critical. And if you see how she kind of laid out um, the, the um, abstract shapes, and it makes it real easy. This looks difficult if you're just tuning in. All right. And I'll definitely be putting the finished um, demonstration, the finished. Um, this will be an alla prima, so it won't get to a super fine um, result. But um, we'll definitely put the finished work in the comments. Here's a comment from Sharif uh, in Pakistan who said, I used pigments in large amounts for more than 20 years to paint movie stars' faces on billboards in Pakistan without gloves. Oh, wow. Great. You're, you're a, a, a true hero. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. Was it acrylic paint, I wonder, or if it was... Um... It, was, it, was uh, it was pigment. Oh, wow. That's very brave. Know. Okay, we're going to have to have you come back on camera now, Mandy. Okay. All right. Thank you All for right. those last couple of minutes. <laughs> I am uh, very impressed. Now, show us your shirt. Oh, so, okay, what's it say for so those who can't shirt, get? Yeah, I made this for all the art teachers and art lovers and all the people who have ever been looked down upon for uh, making your career out of art. It says Department of Aesthetics. So it's like Department of Athletics, except Department of Aesthetics. <laughs> and my favorite part about this shirt is actually what the tag says. So I put a special surprise uh, written in the tag. So if you order one, um, you'll get a special affirmation every time you wear your shirt. Ah, wow. Ah, I love that. Well, I love the way you think. Everybody, thumbs up and applause for Mandy Tice. Uh, Mandy, this was fabulous. Uh, if you didn't see it from the beginning, folks, watch the replay. Mandy, thank you so much for being on today and for stepping in at the very last minute. It's been fabulous. Um, if you guys will just hang with me for a second, I just want to tell you a couple of things. Mandy, applause, big applause. Oh, thank you. Thank All you right. so much. Okay, bye-bye. 
All right. So that was Mandy Tice. And uh, you want to go to the School of Atelier Arts and find out all her stuff, her newsletter, what she's got. She's, uh, she's got uh, Master's of Arts programs, the degree programs. And she's done a lot for the entire industry. What uh, people like Mandy, myself, uh, the Art Renewal League, uh, uh, people like that, our Art Renewal Center, have been trying to elevate this idea of the classical atelier training uh, because we think that that's very important, not necessarily to bring back a particular style or feel, but to get people properly trained. Because when you're properly trained, you can do anything. I, I think that people like myself, when I first started painting, I, you know, I kind of leaned into abstract painting because I knew back in my head, I knew I couldn't draw. And, but now I'm learning that and now it's give, it's empowered me and it gives me so much more. So congratulations to Mandy and others for, for doing what they're doing. Have a terrific day.